the story of an old soul, Julia Magruder. All things considered, it was not strange that Clement Rhodes should have looked back upon his one year of marriage as a mere episode in his experience. His had been a life of more or less excited and turbulent episodes all through, and perhaps that one, his marriage with an ignorant and pretty schoolgirl, was now among the vaguest of all the emotional impressions which were stamped upon his brain. He had been nearer to fifty than forty, and a conventional type of old beau, when he had chanced to be thrown familiarly into the society of this young girl. Young girls were somewhat rare in his experience, for the reason that all such who had anyone to look out for them were protected from the dangers of anything more than a very casual acquaintance with him. He was permitted to take them into dinner, to dance with them, or to pay them any passing attention when they were fully chaperoned, but there the line was drawn. It was an unusual experience for him, therefore, when during a visit to some friends in the country, he found himself frequently tete-a-tete with a girl of eighteen, who had as little idea of protecting herself from a man like him as her hostess had of protecting her. The fact was that this hostess had frankly declared to him her wish that he should marry this girl, saying that she was both too poor and too pretty to look out for herself. The idea, when first presented to Rhodes, seemed absurd in the extreme, for he was poor also and lived in a hand-to-mouth fashion, which he had known better than to ask any woman to share. He had never entertained the possibility of marrying any but a rich woman, and now, as he had grown older and his shiftless habits were more fixed upon him, he had begun to realize that his chance of doing this was very small. The idea of marrying a penniless girl, however, was more preposterous still, and it was therefore a great surprise to him when he found himself committed to this marriage. It had come about simply enough. He was a thoroughly initiated old flirt, and when he had tried some of his wiles upon this ingenue, and she had responded by an innocent revelation of her love for him, there proved to be one note in him sufficiently finely attuned to compel him to act honorably by this young girl who had trusted him. Without stopping to consider how it would hamper him for the future, he married her, and took her to as comfortable a little set of rooms as he could manage to secure. He was in love with her, of course. Falling in love was one of the most facile of feats to Rhodes, and falling out was about as easy. Heretofore, dancers and comic opera singers had been the most frequent objects of his worn-out affections, and the present contrast to all this had undoubtedly something piquant in it. After a few months, however, the prosaic demands of the monotonous home life in the little suburban roost, where his friends never came, grew very wearing, particularly as his wife was delicate and indisposed to join him in his trips to the theaters and concert halls, which had become a confirmed habit of his life. She did not wish to confine him at home, however, and she insisted that he should go without her, so that gradually he found himself slipping back into his bachelor ways. It was very welcome to Rhodes about this time to have any means of drowning care, for he was badgered about debts and expenses, finding it more than he could do to keep going even that poor establishment. He had a desultory occupation as an insurance agent, by which he picked up a little money now and then. But younger and more industrious men were fast pushing him aside, and his income diminished as his expenses increased. It was, therefore, even to his consciousness, just as well that his young wife died. It would perhaps have been better if the baby had died with her, and he could so have buried out of sight all reminder of that strange and incongruous episode in his life. But the baby, a tiny girl, did not die. She struggled through teething and whooping cough and measles and many other such attacks, in the midst of neglect, cold, heat, hunger, and pain, and lived on growing into an almost preternaturally serious, wise, and thoughtful child. There is a theory of which this father and child might be taken as striking examples. It is to the effect that every created soul has the same period of human life to compass, and that it exists in successive human incarnations, 
until that period is accomplished. Sometimes but an hour or a minute may be needed to make up the exact sum, but the reincarnation must necessarily be, even if for no longer a time than that. This theory, we are told, accounts for the phenomena of youth and age, an age in youth which we so often see. In other words, it explains why a very aged person is often silly and childish, and a young child wise and matured in mind. When this occurs, so the theory goes, the old person is in his or her first incarnation, is in fact a young soul, while the child may be in his or her last incarnation, an old soul almost ready to be liberated from humanity and admitted to the higher life. Whether there be truth in this theory or not, certain it is that Clem Rhodes had the attributes of a young soul, ignorant in mind and shallow in feeling, while his little daughter, whom her fond mother had named Clementina, had the mental force and depth of feeling, which might well seem to belong to an old soul. The strangest part of it was the way in which they both seemed to realize the truth about themselves. Although Clementina was now but six years old, and her father was well over fifty, there could be no question as to which of them was the guiding, ruling, dominating spirit. Her mind was as marked for its orderliness as her father's was for the absence of that trait. Quite from within, she had evolved a sentiment of horror for debt and loose dealing of every kind, and she would sit in judgment on her father for such practices in a way which, however strange, he never thought of resenting. In some way never fully accounted for, she had formed the habit of calling him Clem, or boy, instead of Papa. Clementina was by no means beautiful, a small, thin, pale child, with enormous dark eyes, which were so thoughtful and steady in their expression that most people who looked at her, ever so casually, found their attention caught and fixed, and an impression of wonder conveyed to them. The child's life was almost absolutely lonely, in spite of the fact that she had found out and entered herself as a pupil at a small free school in the neighborhood, for she kept apart from everyone, and although she made extraordinary progress in her lessons, she made no friends. It was her father's habit to be absent all day, so she prepared her little midday meal and partook of it alone. By this time Rhodes's flagging energies and accumulating years had reduced him to such poverty that his former rather comfortable set of rooms was now diminished to one, and in this he and the child slept, cooked, ate their meals, and lived. They had two folding beds, which were closed up in the daytime, and a folding table which was then opened. At night the beds were lowered into the central space of the room, and the table folded back against the wall. Rhodes always took his breakfast and late dinner with the child, these meals being cooked and served by her with very little help from him. She also did the marketing and kept the accounts, setting down all her figures neatly and accurately, but getting his help in adding up the columns. The father, of course, had a life of his own, which was as apart from that of the child as her long, lonely hours were apart from his. He had dropped out of society almost entirely, and he frequented the theaters more than ever. Occasionally he took the child with him, but although she never so far relaxed her dignity as to fall asleep, she seemed to get but little pleasure out of it, and her solemn air and deeply thoughtful expression so grated on him that he was glad that she did not oftener express a wish to go. Clementina was a strangely wakeful child, and he had never yet been able to steal into the room, no matter at what hour of the night or with what degree of stealth, that she had not heard him. "'That you, boy?' she would say, her voice sounding strangely conscious in the stillness and darkness. Then invariably she would sit up in her little bed and strike a match and light the candle placed beside her. Then when at her command he would come to kiss her good night, she would give him that swift, searching look, which he always knew was coming, and then if satisfied she would lie down and go quietly to sleep. As a general thing, it happened that she was satisfied, but there had been times when it was otherwise, um, 
and those occasions Rhodes remembered with such distinct unpleasantness that they served him as valuable warnings. She had never uttered any rebuke in words, but the deep, penetrating condemnation of her concentrated gaze had made him feel that for that moment his life was turned inside out to her, and that she saw him as he was. This was all the more painful to him because of the fact that the child seemed to be possessed of an inherent respect for him. She advised and even censured him at times, it is true, but always Rhodes had a sense of being deferred to, and it was a grateful feeling to the heart of such a poor devil as he. Clementina never complained of solitude, and, as a rule, she seemed to prefer these lonely evenings, spent in studying her lessons, tidying things up, sewing on buttons, cleaning spots from her father's clothes, and doing odd jobs of mending to the alternative of going to the theater. Occasionally, however, she would announce that she was going with him, and at such times he never objected. Rhodes had now been a widower for more than six years, and these years had been a tolerably fair copy of his bachelor days, except that he now made his life among people of a somewhat lower grade than formerly, for they were almost exclusively third-rate actresses, dancers, concert singers, etc. It was a life through which he would quickly have sunk very low, but for one thing, the influence of Clementina. She never preached goodness to him, nor talked religion. Poor child, she had been taught little enough of either. And yet she continually held him up to his better self, and dragged him back to it when he fell away. About this time there appeared a celebrated dancer, whose services were engaged for the entire season at the summer garden concerts, and poor old Clem, for the fortieth time, imagined that the grand passion of his life had come upon him. Mademoiselle Tarara was not so far removed from first youth as he, but still she was by no means young. Her matured charms, however, were positively deadly to the troops of boys who attended these concerts, and she soon found herself not only a financial, but a popular success. She was fond of boys, and her intercourse with them was far less harmful to them than it might have been. She had a great deal of rollicking fun in her, and she could always sing better and kick higher when she was spurred on by the enthusiastic clapping and shouting of her young admirers. With the single exception of Rhodes, they were all many years her junior. And if she was fond of the boys, she was also fond of Rhodes, for the very reason that he was a foil for them. Life was behind him, as it was behind her, and she often found his point of view congenial after too much of the boyish element. So Rhodes was admitted to the privilege of visiting her at her own rooms, which the boys were not, and his battered old heart was in the seventh heaven of delight. The people whom he met at the Tarara's rooms were of a sort with herself, and all of them were so easygoing and inconsequent that it was a pleasant reaction from the rather constraining ideal held up to him by his child. Poor old Clem. He had been a dreamer all his life. Of the earth, earthy though his dreams had been, and shifting and unstable as they were in character. The favor which the Tarara showed him now had led him into dreams of a marriage with her, which would establish him for life in the green room and limelight atmosphere which he loved, and would give him not only the Tarara herself, with whom he believed he was madly in love, but also all the other things which he desired in life. In the pursuance of these hopes, he had resolutely concealed from her the knowledge of the fact that he had a child, believing that it would be quite fatal to his cause. In the evenings, when work was over, and the tiny room in perfect order, Clementina would sit alone and think. Of what did she think there in her little chair, so neat and self-collected, with her eyes fixed on space, or else occasionally turned upward to the stars? of which she could see a small bright patch out of her little window. Her experience in this human existence had been so meager, the avenues of knowledge so limited, that it would almost seem reasonable to suppose that she drew upon former experiences in some other incarnation, for the material of that deep thinking and wise doing, 
which continually occupied her. One evening it happened that Clem became conscious of an unusually penetrating and scrutinizing look fixed upon him by this austere child of his, and he imagined that it was in some occult way the result of that investigation, which caused her to announce suddenly, I'm going with you this evening, Clem. Where? he said, surprised. Wherever you are going. I'm going to the concert, he said, and then added dissuadingly, You wouldn't like it. But I'm going, she answered, putting away her dusting cloth after having made the room as neat as usual. He felt a certain protest and anxiety, but he never resisted her, and so a little later they were taking their places in front of the lowered curtain. The prices at these concerts were very small, and there was always a good attendance, but the child and her father, being early, had secured good seats. In spite of himself, Clem was feeling rather uncomfortable this evening. He was not so free to indulge his admiration for the inimitable Tarara with this discordant element beside him, and what if his secret should be discovered? He had, moreover, the strongest feeling that Clementina's eyes invariably saw through the surface of things into their souls. He was afraid for her to see the Tarara, and still more afraid for the Tarara to see her, though, of course, if this should happen, he need not own the relationship between them. Clem now felt a shrinking from the thought of Clementina's comments on the Tarara, and he didn't like the idea of the dancer appearing before the child in her tinsel and tights. She always came out arrayed thus for at least one dance, though she generally changed her costume several times during the evening. As Rhodes took a furtive look at the figure beside him, his sense of discomfiture increased. She was startlingly pale and so slim and delicate that he was not surprised that the people about them looked at her with a certain potty, of which it was evident she took no account. Her odd garments and queer hat also marked her out for special notice, and when taken in connection with all the rest, one noted the strange penetrating gaze of her immense dark eyes. It was not surprising, perhaps, that Rhodes felt uncomfortable and half irritated at the position in which he found himself. That fixed, absorbed look on the child's face did not change when the performance began. It was a merry chorus which made the audience laugh and beat time, but Clementina was unmoved. Then two men came out and danced a clog dance, during which her look remained the same, as if somehow she saw through and beyond it all. It was with a feeling of distinct apprehension that Rhodes now saw Mademoiselle Tarara make her appearance. She was dressed in an Italian peasant costume, but the skirts were shorter and the bodice lower than necessity required. He looked at the child to see if her countenance expressed any disapproval. To his great surprise, he saw that the little pale face had softened into a look of pleasure, as if she recognized something that she liked. The Tarara, meanwhile, was posed, with her hands on her hips, waiting for her cue from the orchestra. As she stood thus, she looked around the house with an expression of friendly goodwill on her face, the true index of a quality in her which accounted largely for her popularity. Then she began to sing. It was a ballad of the homely, pathetic order, such as never fails to go to the hearts of an audience, with its allusions to mother, wife, child, home, etc., and the Tarara sang it with great feeling, Rhodes watching that strange child of his, whom he always felt to be a mystery beyond his kin, saw now a look of deep content and pleasure settle on her face, and some very rare teardrops rise to her eyes. When the song had ended, she turned to him and said abruptly, I love that lady. A strange sense of joy throbbed through the man's heart at these words. They were something more than a surprise. She is good and kind, said Clementina, with the same tone of conviction. I wish she would come back. Rhodes, for his part, rather dreaded that return, for fear the sweet impression might be destroyed. But when she afterward appeared as a smart hussar and sang a barrack song, and then as a vavandire and gurgled her song from over a tin canteen, 
The impression which she had made upon the child was evidently not disturbed. It was noticeable, however, that the Tarara was the only one of the performers who had found favor with Clementina. The others either bored her or roused a feeling of disapproval, which that strong little face well knew how to express. The last appearance of the Tarara was in a ballet costume, and as she floated out on the stage and pirouetted up to the footlights, Rhodes glanced with real timidity at the child. He dreaded the effect of the bare limbs and painted face upon this austere judge. But Clementina's eyes were fixed with a look of unmixed pleasure upon the dancer, who, as Clem now saw to his amazement, caught and returned her gaze. It was for a second only, but there could be no doubt of it, and the child saw it also, for she flushed with happiness and said under her breath, Oh, the sweet lady! With the same look of confidence and content, she followed every movement until the dance was ended. The Tarara, after that one glance, did not again look at the child, but as she skimmed and bounded about the stage, going through all the peculiarly imbecile motions of the modern ballet dance, as she toyed with her tarlatan skirts and sidled diagonally on her poor blunted toes, threw her body backward and waved her arms, then smirked and grimaced at the applause that burst from the house. The child's gaze grew more and more delighted, until it deepened into a look of burning love. This gaze also the dancer caught as she was leaving the stage, and she not only caught but returned it. Rhodes began to feel deeply alarmed for his secret, but the reflection that she could not possibly know that the child was his partly reassured him. The Tarara vanished in a storm of applause. She had outdone herself tonight, and the audience sent up a vociferous encore. Oh, is she coming back? Is she coming back? asked Clementina breathlessly. Her father, greatly wondering, assured her that the dancer would return. But as the applause rose, subsided, then swelled again, and no Tarara appeared, he found that he had spoken too quickly. It became evident that the favorite refused to respond to the encore, and now as four couples in the costumes of Bowery Tuff swaggered out on the stage, the house grew quiet and turned its attention to the new performance. But Clementina would not look at them. Instead, she turned to her father and said, in a voice of emphatic command, Take me to see that lady. Rhodes was accustomed to obey the mandates of this imperious child, but for once he resisted her. I cannot, he said. She is in her room. She is tired. People are not allowed to go to her private room. But I am going, said Clementina, in a tone in which, in all his experience, he had never known her to utter a fiat that was unfulfilled. As she spoke, she rose from her place and took her father's hand, urging him insistently to go. Seeing that they were being observed by those about them, Rhodes yielded unwillingly, and when they were without in the vestibule of the theater, she spoke again, in the same tone. I am going to see that lady, she said. If you do not take me, I will go without you. He was so accustomed to seeing her perform resolutely whatever she undertook, this strange, determined child of his, that he felt that he could not thwart her will, and so he began, in a helpless, entreating fashion, to try to alter it. "'Oh, Clementina, please don't go,' he said. "'Come home with me, please do. I'll do anything you want, if you'll only come home with me now.' "'Not until I have seen that lady,' said the child, an expression of indomitable purpose, making her little face look strangely old. Poor Clem was almost in tears. He felt that he had not the power to resist her, and he felt, at the same time, that if she carried her point his case was lost with a Tarara. He had hoped to win her consent to marry him, and he had meant to conceal the child's existence until the marriage should be over, and then to confess it, throwing himself upon her mercy and offering to put the child in some school or asylum where she should be kindly treated and yet be out of the way. But if Clementina persisted now, all would be lost. 
He resolved upon a subterfuge and a lie. The child's purpose must be frustrated at all costs. If you will come with me now, he said, I will take you to see her tomorrow. Come, Clementina, please. Tomorrow will not do, the child began, in that same tone of resolution. But at this instant a boy came up to them and delivered a message to Clem. This message was a summons to him to come at once to the Tarara's room and to bring the child. With a last effort at resistance, he was beginning to frame an excuse, when, in the very midst of his speech, Clementina said decisively speaking to the boy, I am coming. Show me the way. And the poor old father was scarcely surprised when he found the messenger ignoring him entirely and obeying the words of the child. She had already started after him, and Clem could only follow them in feeble wretchedness and disappointment. The boy led the way through various dusty and dimly lighted passages, and presently paused before a door at which he rapped sharply, and then walked away. A voice said, Come in! Clementina turned the knob and entered, her father following and taking care to close the door behind him. Instead of finding the popular dancer flung in picturesque abandonment on the lounge, drinking iced champagne or smoking a cigarette, which was what Rhodes expected, he saw her seated before her dressing table, on which were scattered a disorderly collection of wigs, masks, powder puffs, curling irons, rouge pots, and various other paraphernalia of her profession. Her elbows were crushing some artificial flowers, as she sat with her chin in her hands, and her gaze fixed solemnly upon her own reflection in the mirror. As she turned toward them, the child ran forward and flung her arms around the dancer's bare neck, lifting her face to be kissed. The Tarara gave a little cry and sprang to her feet, and then the next instant crouched down again and made a motion as if she would cover, with her short tarlatan skirts, the exposure of plump legs cased in thin flesh-colored tights. What had come over her? Those shapely limbs were usually her pride. When had she felt any sense of modesty about them before? But the child was not looking at them. Neither did she look at the false hair, the rouge, the powder, the painted eyebrows, and bistre lids. She had clasped her arms around the dancer's neck again and was looking straight into her eyes. The feeling which came to the Tarara as she met that look was that one creature saw her soul at last. I love you. You are kind and sweet and good, the child said softly, still regarding her with that deep, penetrating gaze and with intense conviction in her tone. The Tarara's painted face began to quiver, and great teardrops brimmed her eyes as she caught the little creature to tow her crushing to irremediable flatness her diaphanous tarlatan skirts. She strained the small creature to her breast a moment and then seated her on her lap. She had caught up a rich plush cape from a chair and had thrown it over the tights and dancing shoes. Rhodes, meanwhile, stood looking on in a state of stupefaction. They had both forgotten him as they clung to each other with close kisses and embraces. A deep emotion was evident in both of them, but its character was different. The woman was stirred to a passionate excitement. Her breaths came in deep, catching sobs. Her face worked with a nervous strain, and her cheeks flushed hotly under their rouge. The child, on the other hand, was deeply calm and grave. She lay with utter contentment in that bedizened creature's arms, and looked up at her as trustingly and unquestioningly as though she had been a Madonna. This long, deep, concentrated look was undisturbed, as she said with a wondering seriousness, Are you my mother? No, darling, no, the dancer said, bending above her with a mother's tenderness, while the tears ran down her cheeks, making a pitiable daub of black and white and red there. My mother died, the child went on looking only at the gentle eyes of the woman and speaking in a grave and placid tone. And my little baby died, the dancer said. She would have been as old as you, 
She died before she ever knew her mother's face, and my heart has been empty ever since. I love you, said the child. The strong spasmodic movement with which the dancer crushed her to her heart as she said these words must have been physically painful, but if it was, the child gave no sign, except a radiant smile of joy. There was a look of almost holy calm upon the little pallid face. She put up one small hand and patted lovingly the smeared face that bent above her. "'You are good,' she said. "'Am I, darling? Oh, I should like to be. If my little baby had lived, perhaps I should have been. Though everybody has been bad to me, no one has ever loved me as you do before. "'Your little child loves you,' was the quiet answer, still with that look and tone of knowledge. Oh, do you think she does, and that I will sometime have her again? Yes, said the child, with a certainty that seemed to make doubt unreasonable. Then looking around as if in sudden recollection, she said, Clem, boy, come here. At these words, a lingering hope sprang up in Rhodes's heart. This strange mode of addressing him might enable him to keep his secret still. If he could only get the child away now, and tomorrow contrive some way of accounting for her. With this end in view, he came forward, the child turning on him as he did so, the fond, penetrating look he knew so well. The dancer glanced quickly from one to the other, but it was the child she questioned, and not the man. "'Is he your father?' she said. "'Yes,' said Clementina. "'My mother died when I was very little. "'He has been so good to me. "'But what was the matter with Clementina's voice? "'And why was her breath suddenly so short and difficult? "'Rhodes was conscious of this, "'even in that moment when he realized that his secret was revealed "'and his hopes of the Tarara blasted. "'She was conscious of it, too, "'and her face took on a sudden look of terror.' Rhodes dropped upon his knees beside the two, who still clung to one another in that close embrace. Over the child's drooped head the man and the woman exchanged a quick, scared look. Then both looked at the child. The gaze that answered their excited ones was so calm, so strong, so full of knowledge and assured content, that outwardly at least they were quieted. One thin little arm lay still around the dancer's neck and with evident effort she lifted the other and laid it around the neck of her frightened childish old father. Almost instantly it fell back heavily. There was a little twitch of the thin body, a stifled breath, one more sweet glance of love, and the child lay dead between them. In a moment all was excitement and confusion. The alarm was given. People thronged the room. Doctors were summoned but one look assured them that all was over with the child. The Tarara, with trembling limbs and chattering teeth, threw on some clothes and drove home in the carriage with Rhodes, holding the dead child all the way close pressed against her heart. Only once did the woman speak to him. It was when, between them, they had got the little body up to the tiny room which had been its home in life and had laid it upon one of the folding beds, which had been so neatly made a few hours back. Then the Tarara, glancing around the poor place, so purely clean and orderly, taking in the details here and there, the child's slate and lesson books, and her little work basket, with its half-used spools of thread and small brass thimble, and contrasting it with her own sumptuous rooms and luxurious living, turned her gaze upon the man who stood helpless and miserable in the midst of this poverty-stricken home, and said, I would have married you for this child. You should have let me know 